Right. Hello and welcome everyone to this episode of the Magnets seminar series. Before we start, let's have a quick look at the format of today's seminar. As always, it will be a 25 to 30 minutes presentation that's going to be followed by 10 to 15 minutes of time that will be open for questions. After this, we will have a short informal time for for catch up and chat that will not be recorded. For this week's seminar, we are excited to have Boris Robert from GFC Potsdam in lovely Germany, who will talk about high velocity polar wonder in West Africa and its implications on the ediacaran magnetic field. Boris, if you could share your screen, then the floor is all yours. Okay, perfect. So thank you very much for your invitation. Um, I'm running a bit out of battery, so I'm going to just switch off my camera. Hello, everyone. So today I'm going to uh, talk about um, um, data, paleomagnetic data and geochronological data from uh, West Africa and discuss the hypothesis of true polar wonder and perturbation of magnetic field during the Ediacaran. And uh, this work is a collaborative work and uh, the co-workers are listed in the, in the bottom of the the slide. So let's first start about, uh, let's first define the Ediacaran. So the Ediacaran is the last geological period of uh, the Precambrian, and it lasted from 635 to 538 uh, million years. Many uh, major uh, phenomena occurred in the superficial layers of the planet during that period, including uh, rapid uh, evolutionary biological changes, like the appearance of the Ediacaran fauna, major disruption in the carbon cycle uh, with the largest uh, Delta 13 C excursion uh, recorded in carbonates, and also um, many uh, glaciations of, uh, observed in uh, continents, and that could uh, indicate uh, global scale uh, glaciations. And a major forcing for these superficial processes could be paleogeography. And during that period of time, uh, the Ediacaran, uh, there is uh, the last uh, final fragmentation of the supercontinent Rodinia, and also the amalgamation of Gondwana, which is going to be a major land mass uh, constituting of uh, Pangea. But the paleogeography for that period of time is uh, very is, is still very debated, and, um, and this is the, the topic of this, uh, this presentation. The reason for this uh, complex, uh, for this debate is partly because of the paleomagnetic record that is very complex to interpret because it is very uh, highly scattered. And to uh, illustrate this idea, here I show uh, the paleomagnetic data from uh, Laurentia, the North American uh, craton of that time. Uh, so here it's a compilation of 2011. So there are a bit more paleopores since then that have been published, but uh, the, the main idea remains the same, that the, the paleomagnetic pores are very scattered and seem to be organized into two groups of pores, shown here in uh, pink and green, divided by about uh, 90 degrees and of a similar age. And if these pores are used to reconstruct the position of the continent, uh, Laurentia would have moved from a high latitude to low latitude very fast with some period uh, reaching a velocity of more than meter per year, which seems very way more fast, way faster than what we, we observe for the uh, more recent uh, times. And uh, it seems difficult to be explained by what we know about the physics of uh, plate motion. Some people have proposed that um, there could be true polar wonder as an explanation for this large polar wonder path. And uh, true polar wonder, this is the movement of the Earth relative to the spin axis. And this, the sketch is showing this. So before true polar wonder, we have here, uh, on the left, and after a large true polar wonder of 90 degrees, we can see the entire uh, surface with, which has moved relative to the spin uh, axis. 
And this process is uh, produced by results from the conservation of the angular moment tool. And on geological time scales, it is produced by the changes in the, uh, the distribution of mass heterogeneities inside the mantles produced by mantle convection. And this is the uh, light material in plumes and the uh, um, dense material in uh, slabs, basically. Another hypothesis to explain this uh, data set is uh, the presence of uh, artifacts uh, in the data, uh, and uh, notably the existence of unrecognized uh, remagnetizations. And uh, for example, one possibility could be that one of the two groups of pores uh, would be affected by a remagnetization. And for example, if it was the case for the pink group, we would uh, get back to much uh, lower plate uh, motion where Lorentzia would stay at uh, low latitude in this example. Another hypothesis is the hypothesis of perturbation of the magnetic field um, where uh, the, so this, this idea uh, relies on the fact that uh, for the ejectoran, the, the magnetic field could be very different than the one we have today and uh, could be dominated by a magnetic dipole oscillating from um, an axial position as we have today to uh, a position where the magnetic dipole is uh, lying in the equatorial plane as we see on uh, the sketch in the, the right uh, part of the, the, the slide. And these two states, you could have oscillation between these two states pretty fast. So the trying, in this presentation, I'm gonna to try to test these different hypotheses. Uh, so the hypothesis of remagnetization, magnetic field perturbations and uh, true polar wonder. And uh, something important is that if uh, it was magnetic field perturbations or true polar wonder at the origin of this palomagnetic data set, we should see this uh, large polar uh, wonder path on a lot on every continent uh, at the same time. While if it was a remagnetization, that should be a local uh, process or regional process. So that's why uh, uh, I conducted a palomagnetic study in uh, Morocco uh, to um, sample uh, uh, pyroclastic rocks uh, in uh, the anti-atlas, which are representative of the uh, West African Craton. Morocco is located in the northern tip of the West African Craton, here shown in orange in this little sketch, this little figure. And the anti-atlas, uh, in the anti-atlas, there are uh, in layers where outcrop Precambrian rocks, and notably Ediacaran uh, rocks. And we sample these pyroclastic rocks, uh, they dated between 575 and 530 million years. And on the right, there is a picture showing these successions of uh, pyroclastic uh, deposits. Um, we obtained several palomagnetic uh, directions from this study. First, uh, palo, um, component A that has been acquired during the, uh, the folding event. Um, and the folding event in this region is of Hercinian age, so uh, related to the collision between uh, Pangea, uh, between uh, Gondwana and Laurisia uh, about 300 million years ago. We also identified two other palomagnetic uh, directions, uh, B1 and C, that, are, that have been identified in the middle and upper part of the Warzazad group for B1 and in the lower part. Uh, of the Warzazad group in uh, regarding the component C. And both uh, directions are supported by a positive uh, fault test. And B1 is supported also by a positive intraformational conglomerate test. And so based on this um, information, we interpreted, it, uh, we interpreted these um, directions as being primary. Here are the palomagnetic poles calculated from these uh, directions. So B1, C, and A. And uh, something uh, important was to compare these palomagnetic poles with the other palomagnetic data that has been published for uh, the uh, West African uh, Creighton. And for this, we use selection uh, criteria. 
to select the best uh, palomimetic data. So an age error, for example, for the pole less than 20 million years, and A95 less than uh, 16 degrees, etc. So here are uh, the, the here is the result we, we obtain where we identified that a lot of palomimetic poles were uh, um, uh, remagnetized during the Hercinian collision. Finally, we selected uh, one pole from the literature dated at 615 million years, and that uh, display uh, with the, uh, the the other palomimetic poles we obtained in this study a large loop between 615 and 565 million years with an apex at 571 uh, million years. We also replaced the apparent polar wonder pass for uh, Laurentia uh, based on a similar, uh, the same uh, selection criteria. And we, we found uh, like a large uh, oscillation as well in uh, Laurentia um, between 615 and 565 million years. And also large oscillations in uh, Baltica, so the North European craton, with oscillations between 615, 600, 565, and 550 uh, million years. This uh, large, uh, we, we, we wanted to compare this, then this large uh, uh, oscillation between the different uh, blocks by superimposing uh, them. And uh, this is what we, what is represented on this figure. So in blue are the poles from uh, West Africa. In orange are the poles from Baltica, and in cyan are the poles from Francia. And we can see that there is uh, a, a good match between the different uh, apparent polar wonder paths, uh, where the poles at 615 are all together, poles around 595, 75 million years are together, and poles at 565 are uh, together. So there is a good correlation between this apparent polar wonder pass in time and amplitude. And if we look at the paleogeography obtained with this uh, fit, we also obtain a paleogeography, which, which is consistent, which is consistent with geology. And uh, that is um, uh, where there is the Iapetus ocean that separates these different blocks that has uh, just opened. And so this uh, consistency with paleogeography also supports the deep dipolar nature of the magnetic fields and also uh, seem to um, indicate that there is uh, no remagnetization in this uh, data set. We uh, then try to test the Chupala wonder hypothesis by combining paleogeography and uh, simple mental dynamic uh, simulations and uh, try to, by trying to, to, to find uh, uh, scenarios of uh, mental convection that could explain uh, that could produce two polar wonder that explain the palomagnetic data. Uh, so we investigated uh, a lot of different scenarios and we found that uh, a possible uh, way to explain the data is by changing dramatically the distribution of subduction uh, zones at the beginning of the Ediacaran. So we can see these two paleogeographic uh, reconstructions here with a large, uh, the, the activation of a large girdle of subduction in red here, surrounding the continents at 635 million years. And this would um, uh, produce a, a large destabilization of the inertia and would produce a large true polar wonder as shown here in black that at first order can explain uh, the um, palomagnetic data shown here in uh, blue. But still, in this uh, very extreme uh, change in mental uh, convection, we could not uh, uh, obtain velocities higher than three to four uh, degree uh, per million years. And that means, uh, and this is because of the viscosity of the mantle that break uh, the deformation, that breaks the deformation of the planet, and then uh, the resulting true polar wonder. So an important parameter then to test, uh, further, to further test this uh, hypothesis of true polar wonder is the, the velocity of palomagnetic uh, changes. Uh, so as I said, true polar wonder could not be faster than some degrees per uh, million year, while we could expect in the case of magnetic field perturbations that the velocity of changes 
to be way faster. And this is, uh, for example, illustrated by magnetic reversals where you can have the magnetic changes of the order of 10 degrees per uh, 1,000 years. And so uh, to further investigate um, this uh, hypothesis, uh, I, um, and we, we obtain new geochronological uh, data to better date these large palomitic changes because the available geochronological data could not uh, distinguish between these two uh, hypotheses. So uh, we obtained seven uh, new uh, ages um, in the Warzazat group uh, in collaboration with Fernando Corfu, who made uh, uh, lab uh, experiments at the University of uh, Oslo. Uh, so we redated uh, samples um, in the lower part of the Warzazat group uh, for the basically the pole giving a low expected latitude. And uh, the, the data also in the upper part and for the other pole, and um, also data in between to have an age progression and test the evolution of the geochronological data with stratigraphy. So here are some of the Concordia results. So in some cases, we found very a good agreement between uh, most of the dates uh, within the sample. And this is the case of uh, the, 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 the sample in the upper, uh, upper left corner, with yielding to a, a, an age of uh, 569 uh, million years. And in some other cases, it was uh, more uh, dispersed, as it is uh, shown here on the upper uh, right corner, where the dates are more spread and could be interpreted as two uh, groups, uh, two um, age um, plateaus at 569 and 565 million years. So here is the summary of all the, uh, the dates we obtained for each uh, sample from stratigraphically older on the right to younger left, and each column is uh, one sample. Um, and we can see that there is a high uh, dispersion in uh, samples that could be explained by two processes. Uh, first, the existence of uh, xenocrysts, but also antechrysts, which are uh, crystals that uh, crystallized in the magmatic chamber uh, a bit before uh, the uh, extrusion of the, the volcanic uh, rocks, and that would have a slightly older age then. And this, the presence of xenocryst and antichrist is uh, typical of um, explosive uh, volcanism as we are studying here. But there is also the presence uh, potentially of uh, lead loss, uh, putting um, dates uh, to a younger uh, age than the age of emplacement. And uh, this lead loss uh, could be uh, produced by the Hercinian orogeny that has been uh, responsible for a low temperature uh, 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 heating of the, the rocks. And we could not, we, because of the proximity of the age of emplacement of the rocks and the Hercinian orogeny in time, the Discordia uh, would parallel uh, the uh, Concordia curves. And so it, they are difficult to uh, be distinguished. But uh, the, what, what we can rely on is the age uh, plateaus in samples that should be representative of uh, the uh, age of uh, emplacement. Because of the uh, because of this dispersion still, we, uh, we, we constructed two end member edge progressions, uh, a red here edge progressions that uh, produce a very uh, fast, uh, quick emplacement of this uh, two, between these two um, a, a quick uh, time gap between the emplacement of the two uh, formations, and which relies on uh, the uh, best uh, um, best data. And uh, another uh, edge progression is shown in orange. That would be the edge progression that yield to the largest time gap between the emplacement of the two uh, formations. And like that, we can. Uh, bracket uh, the maximum ages of uh, uh, emplacement of these two uh, formations. So because of these two edge progressions, we have two sets 
of uh, ages for the two poles. Uh, the red pass uh, yield uh, an, an age of 571 and 569 million years, and the orange slash yellow yield an age of 575 and 566 uh, million years. So the question now is what is the velocity uh, between uh, the velocity associated? So to, to do so, uh, we, uh, we, we did a Monte Carlo, we followed the Monte Carlo approach to um, take into account the uncertainties, the special uncertainties of the palomitic pole, so the A95, but also the uncertainties related to the uh, geochronological data we just uh, obtained. So we, uh, we drew uh, 10,000 um, palomagnetic uh, synthetic palomagnetic uh, poles uh, from each of the two uh, distribution. Uh, and we also sampled uh, randomly NH based on the uh, distribution uh, associated with the geochronological data. And this is the results we obtained for in uh, the orange H progression and for the red H progression. And, and this is uh, different velocities that has been that have been calculated so we can see that the median uh, velocity for the uh, orange um, progression is of 11.6 degree per million year and it is uh, 56.8 degree per million year for the red red edge progression so if we compare now this uh, uh, two polar wonder uh, no this sorry this um, um, velocity estimates with what we know about true polar wonder, so the observations of true polar wonder, but also the velocities that we can obtain in uh, numerical simulations. Uh, this is what we, uh, that is compared on the, this uh, little panel where the scale is reduced from zero to 12 degree per million year. So we can see that um, the velocities we obtain are way higher than uh, the true polar wonder estimated for the last 550 million years at about one degree per million year. We can also see that uh, the velocity uh, estimates we obtain are uh, also very uh, much uh, higher than the best two polar wonder fitting model uh, that we obtained in our uh, study of 2018, uh, where we, with the large reactivation of the subduction zone. And uh, the largest uh, estimate I found in the literature for true polar wonder velocity is uh, the study of, of Kreveling et al. in 2012. And we could, they, they, they obtained velocities of, of about eight degrees per million year. Um, and that, that could be quite close to the median value, but this type of true polar wonder is of uh, low amplitude of, of about 40 uh, degrees and could not explain the 90 degrees um, amplitude found in the in, in the in the data, but in any case, our preferred H progression in red is way above any of these uh, estimates. So it seems then that uh, it is difficult to reconcile uh, the this velocity estimates with the, the true polar wonder hypothesis. And if it is not true polar wonder, could it be uh, magnetic field perturbations? And interestingly is that uh, the distribution of palomagnetic poles that uh, we, we obtain from our selection could be explained by uh, um, the hypothesis of uh, uh, equatorial and axial uh, dipole, uh, because we, have to, we, we see these two groups of, uh, of uh, poles. And so that could, that could uh, work. Interestingly, uh, since a decade, uh, a lot of uh, new studies have um, shown that um, the magnetic field during the Jack run would be uh, very uh, uh, atypical, uh, notably uh, based on a palo intensity estimate. So here in, on this uh, graphic is shown the palo intensity uh, estimates for uh, the uh, Jack run and uh, Cambrian. And we see that uh, um, values uh, less than 10% of the present day uh, magnetic field uh, value are uh, reported. Um, there are also uh, very high reversal rate that has been uh, also observed for this uh, period of time. And uh, it has even been proposed that 
uh, this perturbations or uh, this um, uh, data could uh, show that there was the crystallization of the inner core uh, associated with these perturbations uh, at the origin of these perturbations of the magnetic field. So, okay, if this uh, hypothesis of uh, axial uh, equatorial uh, dipole uh, is, is the, the right one, uh, what, where would be the, 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 the axial dipole uh, component? And uh, the way to answer uh, this question is to uh, compare this, uh, the paleogeography we obtained by fitting these two groups of uh, poles with um, paleogeographies obtained for uh, later times when we think that the magnetic field was behaving uh, normally. And so we can compare the paleogeography uh, for the adjacent with the paleogeography obtained at 500 million years, for example. And at 500 million years, Laurentia is at low latitude, Baltica is at mid latitude, and West Africa is at high latitude. And um, this is uh, consistent with the latitudes obtained in the case where we consider this group of poles as being the axial dipole component, where West Africa is at high latitude, Baltica at mid latitude, and Laurentia at uh, low latitude. So, Based on this um, uh, comparison, uh, we could interpret these two groups of poles as being uh, the axial dipole here and the equatorial dipole. So, but of course, this uh, comparison uh, is only valid if we consider that the paleogeography hasn't evolved too much uh, between uh, 565, 570 to uh, 500 uh, million years. Another interesting observation is that. Uh, uh, it has been observed that there are uh, glacial uh, deposits in uh, the anti-atlas in the so in, in Morocco uh, between 590 and 580 uh, million years and uh, if this group of pole was indeed uh, produced by an axial dipole uh, that would place west africa at high latitude and that would be uh, consistent with the existence of this uh, glacial uh, deposits at that time so to conclude this presentation, uh, I showed that uh, paleomagnetic data display large uh, polar wonder uh, path during the Ejek run in uh, West Africa, and that this uh, large polar wonder seems to be uh, um, global because also observed in uh, other blocks like uh, Laurentia and Baltica. Uh, we obtained uh, new geochronological data that support a very fast polar wonder, which seems to be uh, difficult to be explained by uh, true polar wonder, and instead it could be uh, explained by uh, um, perturbations of uh, magnetic field, and uh, for example, a uh, magnetic field uh, dominated by uh, magnetic dipole oscillating from an axial to an equatorial uh, position. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this great talk. Let's all give a virtual round of applause for Boris here. Now we will have 10 to 15 minutes for some questions. So if we have any questions, please let me show your hands. While we're waiting, I can I can start off with one. I've, I've been following your your stuff in West Africa a bit, and it's, it's really interesting. So now um, that that you have the models that that don't agree with true polar wonder, have you have you come across any rocks that that you think would be suitable to do intensity studies as well on them? So this is mostly a hematite that is carrying uh, the magnetization in most of the, the rocks. So, uh, and we, we don't, we, it, it was pretty rare to see a single domain magnetite uh, that could be suitable. Uh, I, think, um, I think for this reason, the, the data, are, the, the, the rocks would not be perfect for pellet intensity, but uh, I, should get, I should look back to this data uh, again, uh, to because to, there, there, there could be some, uh, but uh, I, 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 should, I should look at this uh, again more closely. <laughs> What's interesting, I mean, non-ideal non rock for intensities are very common in, 
yeah, at, yeah. at that time. So, but anything... that would be great. That would be great to obtain, uh, yeah, Palo intensity uh, uh, data on this uh, on these rocks, definitely. Yeah. Um, maybe for the the Cambrian, uh, the Cambrian, they, they could be. Yeah, I I can I can uh, I can look at this. Yeah, definitely. All right, we have Mary who is muted. Yeah, um, sorry, this is probably just, I've just missed something stupid here. But um, if you go back to slides 20 um, and 18, 19, when you've got the yellow and red age progressions. Yeah, here? Yeah, well, I guess it's it's actually on slide 19, which is where you've got the, the two geochrons with the two different Oh yeah, here, yeah, 19. Yeah, I was just wondering, like I didn't fully follow how you got these two different, what the difference is between these two age progressions. Oh, okay. Using... Yeah. So this is um, basically I, because um, I interpreted the data based on age plateaus. And uh, so in some uh, samples, plateaus are, uh, there is a one plateau, one unique plateau. In this case, for example, and in this case, but in some other uh, samples, it's more complex. And it seems that there could be two plateaus, for example, U63. And so uh, what, what I try to do because of this dispersion is to uh, try different uh, scenarios. Uh, one, two extreme cases. One which would, which would have the, the, the quickest time of the smallest time gap between the, the emplacement of these two formations, the red, age progression, and one which would lead the uh, largest time gap between these two uh, formations, basically, to try to, uh, to, 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 to reflect at best the uh, data set. Yeah. Cool, so that means that the, the yellow one, which is the, um, sorry, the yellow one is the, yes, the minimum time between them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so also yeah, something really something that could be a bit confusing here is that uh, the paleomagnetic poles are obtained in these two these two samples are uh, representative of one paleomagnetic pole. Yeah. So this is not exactly uh, the change of formation that matters here, but these two samples and these two samples because in between we didn't observe. Uh, the uh, palomantic uh, directions that we are interested in. And so there is here a, a gap stratigraphically. Uh, so uh, also something we try to do is to use the stratigraphy uh, information to make our choices about the age progression to, to try to, to be the most consistent as possible. All right, thank you, Mary. Thanks for that. Uh, Andre? Yeah, uh, uh, Boris, th thank you for the great talk. Very interesting. Um, well, uh, I have actually two related questions. Uh, were you able to estimate the, have you observed the reversals? Yes, we, we okay. observed and, reversals, yeah. And could you estimate the reversal rate? If you uh, for your different age constraints, no, no, we could not because uh, so basically this is this kind of successions we we worked on, and we 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 don't really know the age between uh, okay, this, okay. this different but, the, but, because, but, and, uh, yeah uh, yeah so, but for uh, for for the separate fragments uh, up and down separately no or. Oh, or you just or you just see the one polarity in the upper part and another in the lower part do you uh it was it was more in some flows were um mm -hmm. reversed and some flows were uh normal okay. Okay. Um, and also this these rocks are were deposited in uh, yeah. aerial yeah. environment so we don't have sediments in between, yes, okay. you don't see, okay. uh, and so it's uh, it's very hard to know the age, the time gap between each uh, yeah, the position of each flow. Okay, 
Yeah. And uh, the, the related, possibly the rela uh, related question, uh, uh, do you have enough uh, data points to get the estimate of a paleocircular variation? Uh, so I can show you here. Yeah. But so, those are poles, uh, those are poles or directions? So for B, B1, so all this data are uh, uh, site mean directions. Okay. That, and uh, too few so for there. this, this yeah, one, but I then, think but then like... that, could, that could be worked with, yeah, I think. B1, I think, could uh, could be uh, could be used for something, right? Yeah, Maybe. which we, I remember we, we, we estimated the S parameter. Yes, yes. Uh, and it was quite high uh, for yeah. these two components. Uh, okay. I think way more than uh, something like between 25 and 30, something like this. Well, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not that high. If you, I have if to you check that again, but this is in the paper. Uh, yeah, if you, if you the get, to, is in the paper. get to the high latitude, uh, then it's not that high, particularly high. OK, thank you very much. Great talk. Uh, thank congratulations. you. Thank you, Andre. Uh, do we have any more questions? Uh, yes, Simon, go ahead. Hi, uh, Lars, that was a great talk, thanks. Um, I was just wondering about, you know, this equatorial dipole. Um, is it possible that there's another explanation where it's just like a more multipolar field and it's a bit more random than than an equatorial dipole and how does that equatorial dipole exist if it was that yeah so for the multipole uh, uh, for the multipole field i would say uh, I, 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 of course, I cannot really <laughs> say if, if, if uh, which fraction it would be, but uh, um, uh, something that I found interesting is that this large polar wonder uh, oscillations are found in, uh, we, we find a similar pattern in uh, blocks that are uh, geographically uh, uh, far away from each other. So to me, that's, uh, seems to indicate uh, that uh, we need uh, at least uh, uh, a dominant contribution of uh, a dipole. Uh, but then that would need to be uh, done in a compare, like uh, make some modelization of what we, what kind of field we would could explain the, the data. But from this consistent uh, argument, I would say that uh, we need a contribution of uh, a dipole. Uh, then for the existence of an equatorial dipole, um, I know that this uh, equatorial dipole is debated. And uh, I know that uh, geodyna geodynamo modelers are not all uh, happy with an equatorial dipole because uh, uh, because of the rotation of the Earth, we, we would prefer to have uh, an axial uh, dipole uh, field. Um, in, in, interestingly, then uh, there might be this uh, effect of uh, the inner core crystallization, uh, where the, the flow uh, in, the, in, the, in the core could be uh, very different. So um, I'm not sure we have the, we, we don't really know uh, yet, but uh, could it be that by combining uh, uh, Earth's planet without an inner core and a strong uh, heat flux heterogeneity, we could uh, get to this uh, kind of uh, solution? Yeah. 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 It's a good yeah. idea. Thank you. All right, thank you both. Do we have one more question? If not, then let's all thank Boris again with another virtual round of applause.
And then Thank you very much. Let me share my screen one more time. Just before we head out of here, a uh, reminder that there are a couple of magnet seminars coming up pretty soon. The next one is already next week. And we will stay in the Eastern Hemisphere time slot until the end of August when we move back to the Western Hemisphere time slot. And as always, we are, of course, looking for more speakers, preferably early career scientists. And as all the previous talks, this presentation will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Make sure to check it out. And if you're watching this on YouTube right now, then make sure to smash those like and subscribe buttons so you don't miss out on any of our future uploads. And that's going to be it for today. Thank you all for watching. And I hope to see you all again next time.